One of the things I wanted to talk about when you talk about the physical exam is that you know, everybody's environment's a little bit different. Most of everybody in this room is going to be doing exams in, in different situations, either in the crowded training room, sideline, whatever. Uh, most of what we do, obviously, is uh, in the office space with a little bit more controlled, maybe some more room. But when you're going through your exam, there's, there's times to be focused on a particular uh, exam finding that you're just trying to get a quick answer and then you're moving on uh, like a sideline situation but in the office you're kind of going through a little bit more of that so I'm gonna tailor it some to the sideline things if you had to get a quick and dirty exam on an ACL yes or no um, you know you don't have to get you know everyone wants a diagnosis right away but you don't you don't need that right away coach is screaming at you is he ready to go is he not you just you know give me five seconds to at least examine the patient so um, certainly every exam in orthopedics is only as good as your history taking so we're kind of putting the cart in front of the horse but you have to ask some quick appropriate questions when you're talking about whatever you're going to examine in particular the knee so most of the acute injuries you may or may not have seen but certainly you want to try to recount what happened the best you can if you didn't actually see it, what happened on the field or you know, in the gym or whatever. Um, when the people come in the office, that's what we start with, you know, what happened. And it's not really enough to say, well, you know, I twisted my knee playing basketball. Well, you, you need to kind of get into the details of what happened. What exactly was the position of the knee? Was it a contact injury, non-contact? Have you had problems before? All these things, the litany of questions that we go through in order to either focus our exam or to make us better once we do our exam, okay? So, um, <clears throat> fortunately in orthopedics, unless you're a spine surgeon, you have two of each thing, right? Or if somebody had a, an amputation, obviously you don't, but fortunately what we do is we always start with the other side. One of those things you have to get used to doing. If you're running out in the field and somebody's holding their knee, well, you don't really need to go to the other side and examine that and see, you know, what their laxity is on the other side. But if you're in the office or you're in the training room and you really want to try to quantitate differences, there's nothing better than a supposed control from the other side. You know, you have to ask them if they've had surgery or injuries to the other side, but that will help kind of get you a baseline, some kind of barometer. So the other thing that does when you examine the patient and you start with the other side, is it gets them used to kind of you getting, getting the exam started. If you go right in for the, for the kill and start, you know, pulling on the knee and uh, they start guarding and then you, you end up with not getting your best exam. Which reminds me, your best exams are, number one is on the field kind of right away. On a ski slope right away, you know. Um, your worst exams are you know, 24 hours later, 12 hours later, things like a football, they hurt, they don't want you to touch them, et cetera. So that's a great example. For the, for the guys that are, are, are in operating rooms, your best exam is in the operating room with patient asleep. So take advantage of those opportunities. If you guys come down, you know, like Christopher is coming down uh, to the OR, get a chance in the OR to examine the patient's knees or shoulders or whatever. It really helps you a lot. So, and by the way, any, any of y'all are, are more than welcome to come down and watch surgery or whatever you want to do while, while we have these people out here. Um, all right, so we've done a good, a good uh, dedicated history. Now we want to just start with kind of a global exam. When, depending upon your situation and space available and your, how you want to start to conduct your exam is dependent upon your algorithm. If you want to start with them seated, that's fine. If you want to lay them down, that's fine. There's parts of the exam that I do in probably both of those positions. Some of it depends on if it's an older patient, younger patient, you know, from looking for ligament exam, et cetera. So <clears throat> I know Hawk probably does, you probably do a fair amount sitting. Yeah. yeah. So KISS, mixture. Yeah. So the, um, in general, um, I'll, I start the history, history taking here, but for every exam in orthopedics, be it knee, shoulder, whatever, okay, you're always going to start with some kind of you know, visualization or inspection. So there's an inspection part that you're looking for deformities, swelling, previous scars, 
atrophy, anything that you can pick up just on a visual cue. And from a seated position, especially for the knee, um, if it's a big swollen knee, you can see that. If they have previous scars, you can see that. If it's hot and red and it looks like it may have an infection, you know, you see that. Um, one of the nice things about the seated position to start with is you get a real good shot at the VMO. With them uh, sitting down, you can see, and he's such a specimen, he's got these huge quads, so this couldn't be any better. So you have, these, you have a chance to see if there's you know, atrophy of the VMO, so you know if something's been going on for a while. So they, don't, they, don't, they can't fake VMO atrophy, they can't fake a big swollen knee. So those things are, are a good clue that something's going on. So your, inspe your inspection is really, really important. And then you go to palpation, and you go to particular areas, and we'll go through that. And then you do range of motion, stability, and then special tests. It's the same for every joint, OK? Whatever you're going to do, you're always starting kind of in that, in that framework. So I would, for this, let's say, for instance, he had a, an injury to this right knee. He was, he was on his mountain bike, crashed, got hung up, and comes in with knee pain. So you've gone through your algorithm, what, the, what you've asked them, the questions that you're now focusing in. You know, your, your top five diagnoses are in your head, and you're trying to get to those as quick as you can in your exam. And then any outliers after that, you may try to circle back on as you get more and more information. Stop me if you guys have any questions, by the way. So, um, so your inspection is done. Uh, the palpation. Always kind of, for me, it would start patellofemoral joint, then I'd work towards the joint lines, medial and lateral. Um, if they're point specific, say they have a patellar tendinosis or a tendonitis, and you're really getting more specific in this extensor mechanism, you need to try to really pinpoint those things down. It's not really enough to say, oh, they're, they're tender medially. Well, is it their MCL? Is it their meniscus? Is it, you know, their PEZ, I mean, it could be a variety of different things. So get anatomic with, your, with how you palpate. Don't just kind of, you know, does it hurt over here? Well, that that's kind of gets you started, right? But everybody in here is a smart person. We can start getting a little more uh, fine-tuned with that. We'll show you a couple of uh, specific tests that can bring some of those things out. So um, I palpate the structures that may or may not be uh, tender and then move on to the range of motion. So for me, I'd, for a young guy, I'd have him on, down on the table. Go ahead and just lay back. And I'm gonna, we're going to pretend this is the injured one because you guys can see this. You got to make sure they're comfortable, OK? You don't want their head falling off the side and their legs off here as best you can. I know that the, um, in the training rooms is not always a, the, the perfect uh, environment. Nice. That's great. <laughs> That's excellent. So the, um, I saw this guy in Fox News. He did that same thing the other day. So the, if this is the injured knee, you're going to start with a range of motion exam. So you're going to go to the other side. First things I do is just to kind of get them used to your hands on them as you're on the uninjured side. And you, you take, I just take the kneecap. Just kind of glide their patella around. That gets them used to your hands getting on them and not getting all fidgety. And then just kind of sneak a little peek over here, kind of get them used to touching that other side. And I say, OK, go ahead and move your knee. See what they can do actively. Because you want to know what they can do actively and then what you can do passively, especially in the shoulder. OK? You just get, figure out what their, their normal or control range of motion is. And then your stability exam, the Lachman. OK, most sensitive for the ACL is at about 30 degrees. Depend upon these, these big legs, small legs, et cetera, you size your hands, comfort level. You, you got to kind of get used to a couple things doing the Lachman. But the best way to do a Lachman is to really have kind of support the femur and grasp the distal femur. And then with your hand on the proximal tibia, as you pull forward, OK, you should have a certain amount of translation, and then that end point should be a nice snap, like the, the rope is, the chain is now taut. So you are pulling up on the Lachman, you feel that, and then I'd go right to a pivot shift because I'm still thinking ACL. 
the ACL pivot shift is with some internal rotation, a little bit of axial load, and then I give it a little bit of valgus and try to pivot the knee. The phenomenon of the pivot shift, as we all probably remember, is if you have an ACL out, the tibia is anteriorly translated in full extension. As you flex them down, the IT band falls behind the center of rotation and actually reduces the tibia on the femur. And that's what the shift phenomenon is. So you have to recreate that uh, with your exam. So now we, we've done ACL, because we did Lachman and Pivot. Everybody talks about doing an anterior drawer for an ACL. And I, I would tell you that I don't even think I ever even talk about an anterior drawer. Because it, it's, it's really, in my mind, I do that for other reasons. And really, the only reason I do it, and I tell a patient, I'm going to sit on your foot. And then the only reason I do it in anterior drawer is to remind me to do a posterior drawer. Okay? Your posterior drawer is at 90. That's what's going to define your PCL. Your fingers are on the joint line. So you can feel where the tibia sits in relation to the condyles of the femur. And you can push back. If the tibia keeps translating certain degrees behind or flush with the condyles will tell you how much their PCL is <clears throat> stretched out or not. So you got, eight, you got your cruciate ligaments taken care of, and now you're going to do your collaterals. In this position, if you're worried about a posterior lateral corner, then you would start to do some of that exam, or at least this is where I would bring it in. If they have a corner injury or a posterior lateral corner injury, this is where there's a posterior lateral drawer that will account for any translation in this back corner. If it's this knee, right in here. Okay, you'd be pushing down and out. Okay. When <clears throat> we talk about doing collaterals in general, the collaterals take up their slack at 30 degrees. So that's where you want to do it. Now you can, based on how big these legs are um, and how big you are, you got to use some of, the, some of this to your advantage. If I'm going to check an LCL on a big knee, I'm going to use the bed to help stabilize that leg. And I'm going to drop this leg off the side at 30 degrees, and I'm going to check the collaterals. If I have this leg up here, and it's this huge you know, defensive tackle, and I'm trying to wrestle this thing like a baby hippo, it's just not going to work, right? So you got you to be able to control your environment a little bit. Okay, the same thing, same thing with the MCL because that's the one you're going to be seeing most of, really. You're going to see a lot of MCL injuries. So the MCL is the same thing. You can drop it over the side and you can check that. You can check it in full extension. That kind of gives you a little bit more information about the cruciates, but for the collateral, you're going to be at 30 degrees. Okay. Um, so we've done our ligaments, and now you want to start thinking about what you're going to do for you know, cartilage injuries. The special tests we've started to talk about along the way, because we're talking about the Lachman and the pivot, the posterior drawer, et cetera. Probably the most uh, commonly used would be the McMurray's if you're looking for meniscal injury. And I think it's fairly reliable. Um, not great, but it's OK. And there's two things to quantitate with the McMurray's in my mind. I'll either say they have pain with McMurray's or they have a click with McMurray's or true clunk. Um, the description of the McMurray's is what you're trying to do is with basically with hyperflexion, you're trying to trap that meniscus underneath the condyle. And the best way to do that is to load it. So if you bring them up into hyperflexion, and I put my hand underneath the foot because what I want to apply is some rotation, and I can do that like this. So I deep flexion, and I actually load, and I, tw and I torque that to try to snag the meniscus underneath. The whole time I have my fingers on the joint line. So if I get a McMurray's and I feel a little click right there, and my fingers on it, I can palpate it. You maybe even audibly hear it and say, does it hurt right there? And I say, yeah, it hurts right there. The same thing with laterally. So come on up for a second, Lance. So if you run through those specific tests in general, you're going to get 90% of what you need. Okay, I'm just going to show you a couple quick things for big knees or 
painful knees when you're trying to get a, a decent exam for a Lachman. And actually, Hawk, John Fagan showed me this, um, the prone Lachman. So flip over. <clears throat> when you're trying to do a big knee on a Lachman and take your, your knees down to about the, just towards the, that's perfect right there. So you have a big leg and you're trying to do a Lachman. You need two hands, right, because you're doing this. If you do a prone Lachman, you can use both. I'll show you this leg. What you do is I trap the leg underneath my armpit, and I use the bed to stabilize the femur, and I use two hands. I put my fingers on the joint line, and I bring them down to about 30 degrees, and the translation anterior is that way. So I can push down like that, and I can use both hands. So I don't even have to touch his femur because that's already stabilized. Okay, so that's that's kind of a, a pretty nice trick. While he's there, then you could do heel heights. Correct. Yeah, you definitely could do any kind of heel height differences. We used to do that. All the PTs in here probably, you know, do that all the time. We did it in the army all the time to try to differentiate any problems with extension after ACE, after ACL surgery. Um, <clears throat> Last but not least, when you're here, you can check what we call the dial test. The dial is really to define if you have a posterior lateral corner and or PCL injury. And all that means is you're trying to dial differences at either 90 or 30 degrees when you externally rotate. And here you're looking at the difference of their thigh foot angle. So at 30 degrees, um, I can't really show you this one. Sorry, Hawk. If, if you externally rotate, you got one foot way out like this at 30 degrees, that, that will indicate or potentially indicate there's a posterior lateral corner injury or LCL injury or popliteus, posterior lateral capsule, that whole complex. If you bring them up to 90, we know that 90 degrees tests the PCL. So if your dial is increased at 90 as well, then you also have a PCL injury. It's unusual to have an isolated LCL injury where you'd only see it at 30. It can happen, it's, it's rare, but in general you're going to see PCL increased at 90, LCL increased at uh, 30. Uh, it's probably fair to say that it, Flip back over they back. won't have a dial unless they have some varus opening. So if they have no varus opening when you do stresses, he said, then they won't have a positive dial. I did post your drawer, but um, what, one more time if you lie on your back and 90 degrees on this one. <clears throat> I, I think this is what you're alluding to, Hawk. So your, your, thumbs, your thumbs are on the condyle, and as you drop your thumbs down to the tibia, you should hit the plateau. That means that the tibia has its, what we call the, its normal station, okay? You should have more tibia in front of your plat in, in more in front of your condyles than not. If you push back and you have a little bit, that's a posterior. That's a one plus posterior drawer. If it's flush with the condyles, that's two. And if it's behind the condyles, that's a three. And I don't want to get into the weeds, but that's essentially what we would say. Um, I forgot to tell you about the how to look for an effusion because in my mind. That's kind of a, a red flag that I want to know right away because if there's an effusion, something's going down, right? If there's smoke, there's fire. So there's a lot of ways to do it. Folks, you know, think about, you know, blottable patella. They look for um, a loss of the, this medial dimple, which is really the medial gutter. If the, if the joint is full of fluid, you'll lose that dimple right here. So you can see a comparison view. For me, if you can, can you hold your leg up like that? I wouldn't have them do this, just so you can see. I, I compress the super patellar pouch, which can collect a lot of fluid. All, it goes all the way up to about here. I make a horseshoe around that, the superior part of the patella, and I force the fluid down into the gutter so that if there's a, a slight effusion that may be absorbed and masked by the joint, you can actually bring that out by just kind of pushing down on that pouch. And then you can feel that fluid in that dimple. Right? You like the fluid wave, right? You kind of push on one side and 
and, yeah. and feel it on the other side, right? Sort of milk it up. I think you've seen it. Milk it up and then put it on the outside and you see a little wave. And stuff. That's little bits of fluid. Yeah. Which is some meaningful. Sure. Do you do Pestley's test? Do I, I don't new, normally do that. The Pestley's is it's just if I may keep, so you have sure. a patient standing there, go on one leg and they, and they rotate like that. And they have a minute. I heard a pop, Hawk. Yeah. <laughs> so what happens is they turn like this and they, ouch, it hurts. And that's a very good meniscus test. The yeah. other is a step-down test. We do that one for patellofemoral. Yeah. You ladies who have patellofemoral, when you try to step down, it's all shaking. You just can't. It's a hip problem. That's what Darren was talking about. It's a hip problem. A hip adductor, adductor problem. And it's a step-down test. It's good for patellofemoral issues. And that's, and that, that's, a patel femoral exam, we were talking about translation initially, when they just kind of, that's a good way to get started with that whole thing. But if they're apprehensive when you start pushing them laterally, that's an indicator that they may have some subtle instability there, okay? So we kind of flew through a lot of things, but. Any questions uh, for Keith? I have a quick question. Yes. Question on the pivot shift, is it a feel thing or is it a visual thing? It's, uh, it's both, but uh, you should see, visually see some jump. and. The, you know, teaching a lot of residents and fellows over the year, that, that's years is probably one of the harder tests to kind of get a feel for it. It's really not a, um, it's not a real <coughs> forceful test, and everybody wants to kind of force this pivot and do all these things. It's really just a finesse. <coughs> it's a finesse test that will, you just kind of let them relax, and you're just kind of feathering it in this range at about 0, 30, 45 in here. Um, if they have a huge pivot, it will literally lock and then reduce. So after you do a few thousand, you get sort of. That's <laughs> that's probably true. Yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's an art test, and uh, and so whenever when the operating room we have one, we have everybody come and do it. You know, trainers, 